We're going to have our first reading from the Bible now. It's from Exodus chapter 1. There are Bibles at the ends of the pews if you'd like to follow along. And Charlie will thank you very much, Persephone. An excellent demonstration of what a Bible looks like. Uh, and um, so do grab one of those and uh, open it up in Exodus. If you start at the beginning of the Bible and keep going forward, you'll get there very quickly. Uh, it's the second book of the Bible. We're in chapter 1. Uh, and Charlie will be speaking from uh, this chapter in a few moments. So Exodus chapter 1 and verse 1. These are the names of the son of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family. Reuben, Simeon, Levi and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come. We must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labour and they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labour in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labour, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not, want, did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. And they let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They're vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. But let every girl live. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you very much, Nick. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to tell you about a little game I used to play when I was a kid, and a little bit older, actually. So teenagers, and I even play it every now and then now. It's called Would You Rather. Do you know this game? It's a very simple game. I'll give you two options, and you've got to think which one would you rather do or be or have. And sometimes it's good things. Would you rather be super strong or super fast? Tricky one, isn't it? Sometimes it's, it's bad things. Would you rather always feel just a little bit too cold or just a little bit too hot? What do you think about that one? Would you rather always feel too cold or always feel too hot? Sometimes it's um, like really unpleasant things. Would you rather have a permanent splinter under your big toe or a permanent bad haircut? I can tell you the bad haircut thing has seen me fine through life, so recommend that one. Would you rather sneeze chocolate or have tears that taste like cheese? Which one is it? This is my favourite one, I think. Would you rather be chased by 50 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? Think about it for a second. 50 duck-sized horses or one horse-sized duck? When I was a kid, they asked that. The Chris Moore's Breakfast Show asked that to celebrities. I'll never forget Justin Bieber wrestling through the implications of being chased by a horse-sized duck. What would that feel like? We could go on and on. Now, why have I started with Would You Rather? Well, we're starting a new series at the 915 service in the book of Exodus. And in some ways, the book of Exodus asks us a, a would you rather sort of question. 
And it's something like this, Ollie, if you put the slide on the screen. Would you rather be in Team Pharaoh or Team Yahweh? Now, Team Yahweh might sound weird. Team Pharaoh might sound weird. Pharaoh is the king of Egypt. And Yahweh is the name we're going to find out over the next few weeks of God. Not just any God, but the God who cares for his people, the God of the people of Israel. He reveals himself as Yahweh. And the question in, that, in the, at least the first bit of Exodus is, which team would you rather be on? Now, the thing about would you rather is, they have to be kind of two things in competition. If I said, would you rather be chased by one duck-sized horse or 50 duck-sized horses, you'd take the one. But because it's a bit of a question, you know, oh, super strong or super fast, or always too cold, always too hot, it makes you think about it. And there's something of a kind of would you rather going on at the start of the book of Exodus. You know, if, if you're sort of used to church, you think, well, of course you're going to choose God's team every time. But in Exodus chapter 1, it doesn't look quite so clear. Because at the start of the passage, well, it looks like Team Yahweh is the only one to be on. The people of Israel, the people that God has said he's going to grow into an amazing great nation, they go to Egypt and they start growing. The Israelites were exceedingly fruitful, it says. They multiplied greatly, increased in number. But what, what happens as soon as they do that? Team Pharaoh comes and starts to make their life horrible, makes them slaves. And you think, well, it's Pharaoh who's going to win this. But as soon as Pharaoh does that, they grow even quicker. And so Pharaoh starts to do some horrible things. He starts to want to, to kill the little babies, get rid of them. But as soon as he does that, well, some of the Israelites, they resist they refuse to go along with his, his plans. And so he makes it even worse. And he starts to say, just throw the babies in the River Nile. And that's how chapter one ends. The greatest king of the day, the, the biggest superpower, more powerful than anyone you could imagine in, in this world, has said, let's get rid of all of them. Let's, let's throw the babies in the Nile and that will get rid of the people. That will stop them being great and numerous. If you come to the end of chapter 1, you might think Team Pharaoh is going to win this. I might have wanted to be on Team Yahweh, but things look bad. In here, or over in St. Monica's, we're going to find out what happens next and see if Team Yahweh can come back. Would you rather join Team Pharaoh or Team Yahweh? We're going to find out in our groups this morning. Kids, Time for you to go over to St. Monica's. Grown-ups, we're going to stand and sing our next song, Behold Our God. So let's stand and sing together. Please do take your seats. And we're going to read on in the book of Exodus. We're going to read the first little bit of chapter 2. So it'll appear on the screen again, I think, or you follow along in your Bibles. Exodus chapter 2. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman. And she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. And she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. When Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe and her attendants were walking along the riverbank, she saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, the would you rather question that we began in that talk one with, it's not just a way of kind of engaging the kids. If you read the book of Exodus, these first few chapters in particular, it's like the, the writer sort of draws you in to put it in those sort of stark, you know, X versus Y, this team versus that team terms. And it, although the answer kind of, you know, if we've been around church, we think, well, the answer's obvious. We know, we know what's going to happen with Moses. Everyone knows that Moses is going to win this. It really doesn't look so clear cut. If you sort of enter the story 
and the experience as best we can of these people, the, the Israelite people in Exodus 1 and 2, it really doesn't feel like that's the way it's going to work out. The setup for the story, it looks like actually they're, they're going to do fine. There are two sort of details that the writer draws our mind back to from the book of Genesis in particular. That means at the start of Exodus, you're expecting all to be sort of set fair. Firstly, he reminds us over and over again of the Joseph story. The very end of the book of Genesis is the story of Joseph, who goes down to Egypt, basically ahead of his brothers, becomes a, a, a big leader in Egypt, and prepares the way for them and ensures that they're going to be, they're going to be okay. When the whole rest of the world is, is under famine, the family of Joseph are going to be fine. And these are the very people who we meet again at the start of Exodus. So you're thinking as you begin the story, well, Joseph's prepared the way for them. They're going to have a safe place to live here in Egypt. But even bigger than that, the writer draws our mind back to the start of Genesis and God's plan, God's promise, God's intention for humanity to fill the world, to multiply greatly and, and become a, a, a people who care for his, his creation wonderfully. And that's a promise that he sort of repeats and, and makes more explicit after things go so tragically wrong in the life of Abraham where he makes his promise to Abraham that his descendants are going to be incredibly numerous. The start of the book of Exodus, we see exactly that thing happening. All this language about being exceedingly fruitful. Your mind goes back to the start of the Bible. This is God's purpose for humanity. Your mind goes back to God's plans for Abraham. Children as many as the sand on the seashore, they multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So it all starts off like, you know, this is the way things should go. He wants you to think everything's going to be fine. And then what happens next is that Pharaoh dominates the story. And it's really striking. God hardly gets a mention. There's, there's one bit, really, in the first two chapters of Exodus where God's name is mentioned at all. We'll come on to that in a second. But for most of the story, God's nowhere to be seen. If we're sort of reading the, oh, look, the plans are coming true. But then when Pharaoh comes in and sort of smashes it, I think we're supposed to be thinking, well, maybe we misread. Maybe the plans weren't coming true after all. It seems to me there's, there's a sort of realism about life in the way that this writer writes the story of the, the start of the Exodus sort of tale. I don't know about you, but whenever, whenever something comes up in life that just sort of throws you, that, that makes life hard in an unexpected way, one of the first things that happens to me is that, if you like, the dial where, where kind of God it just turns down a bit. And the, the circumstances dial and all the things that are going wrong turns up. Whatever, whatever I think I, I, you know, I might believe about God, in that moment where, where a tragedy strikes, or, you know, something take, comes from you know, blindsides you, you're not expecting. Even as simple as a, a little second line on a lateral flow test. In that moment, the, dial, the God dial turns down and, and you know, the, the things are difficult dial turns up. And I suppose for, for many of us, it's not that, you know, we're tempted to join Team Pharaoh and think, oh, forget it, God's got nothing. But God suddenly seems most absent in those moments. Time and again, you, you, you read accounts, or you, you know, if, if you know the experience of going through a very sort of dark time, one of the most painful things if you're a Christian is that when God doesn't seem to be with you, you're in the midst of something very difficult, and that's the very moment when you could really do with God supporting you, and he feels far, far, far away. Seems to me that's sort of what's going on in this part of Exodus. If, if we've got ears to hear it, then the plans are being fulfilled. But, well, the, the headline is, things are terrible. Things are going terribly for the people of Israel. That feels true to life. And yet, if we look at the story, if you like, a few steps back, with the benefit of hindsight, in Exodus chapter 1 and chapter 2, actually everything that starts off bad 
everything that starts off bad for the people of Israel, in the end turns out for their good. That's the extraordinary thing about these opening, this opening chapter. All the things that look like, you know, the plans are derailed, in the end work out for good. So that their enslavement, the fact that Pharaoh comes and does these terrible things to them, well, do you notice on the one hand, it doesn't stop them growing. In fact, it seems to somehow accelerate their grow, growing. They become more numerous. And what's really important, it seems that their enslavement actually contributes to them being a nation. So they're not assimilated into Egypt and just become you know, part of the rest of the people. The fact that they're sort of set apart and these terrible things are done to them is what it, part of the, what contributes to them being a people together so that they all leave when the time comes. They're, they're separated. They're, they feel distinct from Egypt, from the Egyptians. And so they leave to somewhere better. They don't just stay with Egypt and, you know, slot in. They go and have these most incredible experiences, meeting God and being his people. When Pharaoh orders the midwives to help him in his plans to keep a lid on this people, it's a terrible moment for them. What a terrible situation to be put in. But what's the, what's the, the, the consequence in their life? Well, by working out how to not obey Pharaoh, they are blessed by God with families of their own, and they become shining examples of bravery. They get their names written in scripture. Most of all, this order to kill the baby boys, the way that chapter one ends, bleak, dark, tragic scene. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile. Because of that order, Moses' mother faces this just unbelievable choice, decision, dilemma. How on earth is she going to... She's got a baby boy. She can hide him for a little while, but eventually he's going to be found out. So she does this crazy, you know, you can imagine the end of your tether thing. Put him in a basket. Float him out onto the Nile. How's that plan going to succeed? But what a moment for her. What a, what a tragic situation to be in. Your hand. Right, so no. And then, of all people, right. to discover the basket, the Pharaoh's the daughter. You think in that moment, as, as, as Moses' mother's yeah, watching, she was going to tip the basket up. That's all she needs to do. Just you, darling, just flick at the wrist. There we are. So it and the baby was gone. Yes, that's yes. And yet, if it wasn't for that order and Moses' mother's heartbreaking, agonizing decision and Pharaoh's daughter turning up, well, Moses might have been dead and buried, gone. But because of all that, Moses has this extraordinary experience. On the one hand, he's a, he, he gets to stay with his mother through his childhood. His mum gets to look after him and raise him. I take it as an Israelite. And as, if we read on in chapter 2, we see Moses sees himself as a member of the people of Israel. He himself doesn't just join Pharaoh's household and get assimilated in. And yet when a time comes, in, into his youth probably... He goes and joins Pharaoh's house on him and becomes sort of trained up as an Egyptian. So he becomes the perfect person to be the leader of God's people, to negotiate with Pharaoh, to stand up to him, to, to, to be in the royal court, and eventually to lead Israel out. Even this darkest, darkest of moments, the order to kill the baby boys, extraordinarily works out for Israel's good, provides them with the leader they need to lead them out of Egypt. One older writer and pastor in America used to say this to people to sort of sum up what it means that you, if you're a Christian and you're, you're sort of walking through life and you're experiencing good things and bad things. He says this, our bad things turn out for good. Our good things can never be lost and the best things are yet to come. He said, that's, that's what's true for a Christian. 
It was true for the people of Israel. They can only see it. Our bad things turn out for good. Yeah. Our good things can never be lost. And the best things are yet to come. Yes, I am indeed. As I've been reflecting on those, those lines, those sentences, I thought, what would change in my life if I believed that in my bones? Problem is, in the book of Exodus, that your bad things turning out for good, it doesn't necessarily happen in your lifetime. If you read on in Exodus chapter 6, we, we, we see um, Moses' family tree. And there are at, at least four generations from Levi, one of the sons of Jacob, who go to, go to Egypt, and Moses being born. There might even be more the way that they did sort of family trees, genealogy. They didn't necessarily mention every, every name. But there's at least generation after generation that is born, and some of them at least would have died before Moses comes on the scene. There have been people in Israel whose only experience being born and growing up and dying was slavery. I wonder how they'd respond to your, your bad things will turn out for good. Well, I've spent my whole life being a slave. I'm going to die a slave. How can you say my bad things will turn out for good? We might look at the midwives and think, well, it was easier for them. Their bad things turned out for good quite quickly. They got families of their own almost straight away. What do we do, the rest of us, when it doesn't look like our bad things are turning out for good? When there doesn't seem any realistic prospect in our lifetime that our bad things will turn out for good? Is it just an empty phrase? Is this just a kind of empty rhetoric to help us get through the terrible things, but actually has no underlying reality. Well, this is where I think it is helpful to look at the midwives again. Because the midwives, and this story, this episode with the midwives, is the place in these chapters one and two where God shows up again, if you like, just in terms of his name. He seems absent for so much of chapter one and so much of chapter two. But those verses, that story of these, these midwives, Shifra and Pua, is where we hear, verse 17 is where it happens. The midwives, however, feared God. Suddenly God comes back into the narrative and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. And then verse 20, God was kind to the midwives. Verse 21, because the midwives feared God. This little oasis where God is suddenly all over the place. These midwives, it seems to me, are, really are a lesson for us in how to go through those dark valley moments when it feels like God is absent. And if we can go through them, we can go through anything. This is how, learning from them, it seems to me in the story, is how we can really walk confidently and say the bad things will work out for good, even if it doesn't look like it. For one thing, what we see in the midwives is, is, if you like, an attitude of faithfulness to God. It says that they feared God. In other words, that they saw him as far, far, far bigger than all the earthly powers. Pharaoh might be doing his thing, trampling on the people, exercising this absolute aut autocratic power. These midwives knew that that wasn't the, the true story. They knew that God was more powerful than Pharaoh. And even though they couldn't see how it was working at the moment, that simple phrase, they feared God. They had this conviction that God was bigger. That as terrifying as Pharaoh looked, he was not, he was not defeating God in the end. He wouldn't do that. And that's what prompts them, that's what spurs them on to this act of defiance against Pharaoh. And it's worth just pausing on what their act of defiance is. Many pages of ink have been spilt trying to work out if, if they lied to Pharaoh and if we can lie too. And, it, you know, it's, it's a very complicated argument. And some people will say, well, you can't possibly lie. Lying, t not telling the truth is the most serious thing. So there must have been some kind of, you know, some kind of eco economy with the truth. And, uh, you know, it's a huge debate. Here's what I think is going on with them. It seems to me that there is an, at least an element of deception. 
But they are, they are, if you like, at the very edge, at the, at the limit of their abilities, faced with this enormous superpower in Pharaoh in Egypt. They're experiencing the, the most difficult, the most painful of choices. And it seems to me they give us an, an example of, of painful, of costly, of you know, agonizing faithfulness to God to help us when for most of the time in our lives we won't quite be in that situation. Comparisons are often drawn between their experience here and the experience of people who tried to hide Jews from the Nazis in the, world, in the Second World War. Mm-hmm. The village of Le Chambon uh, is, is a village of about 5,000, mm-hmm. mainly, mm-hmm. mainly kind of a, a Christian mm-hmm. village. And that village, the Chambonnet, rescued about 5,000 Jews in France from the Nazis. It was said in World War II that that village was the safest place for any Jew across all of Europe in World War II. And when you listen to some of the stories of the Chambonnet and how they interacted with the Nazis, you get the same sort of thing. It's kind of wrestling with being faithful to God and concern for those who are who are being oppressed by these, these awful, cruel powers. But they didn't just say, oh, it doesn't matter what we do. You know, we, we, can, we, can, we can sort of you know, lie as we wish. They, they, it's like the Chambonnet kind of wrestled with how they could be true to God and true to truth, but also save people from the Nazis. So you know, some of the stories you read, a Nazi lieutenant demanded from one of the villages to know where the the Jewish refugees were hiding. And the villager replied, Jews? What would Jews be doing here? You there, have you seen any Jews? So not directly answering the question, but trying to say something that would protect his Jewish friends. The chief of the police, the Vichy police, the sort of collaborating police, interrogated one time the ringleader of the of the of the, the somebody is a pastor, Andre Trocme. It's just incredible. The police chief said, "Pastor, we know in detail the suspect activities to which you are devoted. You are hiding in this commune a certain number of Jews whose names I know. You are therefore going to give me the list of these persons and of their addresses." All the accounts suggest that Trocme replied saying he did not know the names of the people. And that was true because they had actually taken on false identities. They had false identity cards produced for them. But you read what happens with Andre Trockman and the rest of the Chambonnet village, and they are lamenting the fact that they had to have to be deceptive. They are lamenting the fact that they have to, you know, rein back on telling the truth. It's not that they do it easily. They do it with sadness, but they do it sh- with this kind of resolved conviction that this is the way to stand up to the brutality of the Nazis. What I'm trying to get at, if that's what these villagers are doing, if that's what the midwives are doing, they're not just you know, going easy on truth. But at these moments of extreme, costly, agonizing decisions, I'm being put in this situation where I'm being asked to give up these people to certain death. Then they, they, because they fear God, they wrestle with how they can stay true to God, stay true to truth, and save these people's lives. It seems to me that they are giving us an example in this most extreme of moments for us to follow in the rest of life when most of the time We don't have those agonizing choices to make. It seems to me that they're saying something like that. That even when it is at its its most costly and agonizing, with God's help, there's a path through. Fear the Lord. Put him first. And that's what the book of Exodus, it seems to me, is, is all about helping us, each of us, in our own lives to know what it means to fear the Lord, like these midwives. The book of Exodus, if if you like, is all about giving us a big, big, big view of God, a true view of God that 
overwhelms all the other you know, team pharaohs in our lives, all the other things that would have our affection and our allegiance. So, you know, whether in the ordinary and mundane day-to-day or in the extreme, costly, agonizing moments, we would, we would be able to keep the, the God dial turned up and say, because I fear God and I know what he is like, I know his character, I know he's with me, even if I don't feel it. Therefore, I'll be able to be faithful to him and forge a path of trusting him and walking with him. And it's probably where, well, it is where I think we have an advantage, an enormous advantage over the midwives because, you know, we have in their own lives the example of how fearing God and going his way does work out for good. On the big, big, big scale, we can see that even though some of these these Israelites died before they were released from slavery, in the end, God was going to do amazing things for them. We can step back with the benefit of hindsight and say, it really was the case that their worst moments worked out for, for good in the end. And of course, even more so, we have the perspective of seeing the very worst moment in all history when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was thrown out of the city and left to die as a criminal, the worst moment you could imagine, actually turned out to be the moment of greatest blessing for us. And when we see that pattern, then it strengthens us to walk with God through the dark valleys or on the mountaintops, knowing that he's with us and that he won't desert us. And he is working for good. Let me finish with a story that I came across. A friend of mine shared it on Facebook. It was one of her friends. It's a a lady who was on a train. She was commuting. Actually, it's a a train near where Jenny's parents live, going from sort of southwest London into into Waterloo. It was a commuter train. People were sort of tired. It was dark outside, you know, bleary eyes. And this woman was on the train, and she saw two people step on, an older man and a younger woman. And she, she, she writes in the story she tells, she put it on Facebook, that almost straight away, she sort of, her ears pricked up, her sort of antenna, there's something not quite right there. And she sort of, you know, waking up from her bleariness, she leaned in to try to, sort of, what, what, why is this, this picture not quite right? And it became pretty, pretty clear to her quite, quite early on that the woman didn't want to go with the man. The man wanted to get off the train and change trains and go to, to Guildford. He was insistent on getting to Guildford. And the woman was very hesitant, so trying to hold back. And again, as this, the lady telling the story kind of, you know, sort of listened in, she came to the sort of tentative but, you know, fairly sure conclusion that this woman was being trafficked. That, you know, on this commuter train, in, you know, going through the Surrey suburbs, this guy was, was taking this woman against her will somewhere. So she leaned forward and just sort of whispered to the woman, you don't need to go with this man. The person telling the story said she she just started praying. and said, Jesus, I can't see what's going on here, but please give me courage. Courage to do whatever I need to do in this situation. And that was the the prayer she keeps saying. She prayed, please, Lord, give me courage. So she tried to kind of engage the the, the woman in conversation. You don't don't need to go with him. Then the woman seemed to be emboldened by that, started to do something strange at every stop. She would um, get off the train, walk down the platform, and then get, off, get on again at the sort of next set of doors. And the man would follow her. So at each station, she would get off, walk along, get on. And the person turns to her, was like, what, what's going on here? How, I can't, I can't what, why is she doing this? But she's like, well, I want to help, but this, this man is you know, scary. He overpower me. And all the commuters are just sort of sleepily reading the papers or whatever. For want of anything else to do, the lady telling the story said she, she, she followed them. So at the next stop, she got off the train with them. And so, you know, the, the lady was going there, the man following her, and then the woman telling the story following behind. She I didn't know what she was doing. She's praying, like, give me courage. Next set of doors, they all get back on again. And at this point, the man turns around and says, why are you following us? And this is how the story ends. The lady says, I didn't answer. Instead, my eyes moved from his, 
and continued to follow the young woman who had made it to the next set of doors, you know, further down the train again. The alarm for the doors went, and in that split second, with the man distracted, she stepped back off the train. The man, following my gaze, moved swiftly towards the shut doors. Pushing the button, he tried to get them to open again. Too late, they were locked. He turned back towards me. I froze. From across the heads of the sleepy commuters, we stared daggers at each other. Inside my chest, my heart was beating faster and faster. The train started to pick up speed too. He turned and walked through the door into the next carriage. He was gone. I let out a deep breath. Jesus, we won. I remember when I read that story the first time, I thought, that is just extraordinary. <laughs> that on that commuter train into Waterloo, there was something of such deep, dark evil probably going on. And, you know, and even then, it's like probably, there's so much about that story, you think the lady didn't know what happened to this, this woman. But in that moment, you know, she woke up from her slumber and as she prayed, she thought, there's something, there's somewhere I need to step in and do something. What can I do? You know, this man was too powerful. What can I do? But she prayed and she acted. At one point in the story, she quotes a pastor who said, the most dangerous prayer you can pray is this, use me. She said, I believe God calls us to step out of faith into uncomfortable, unfamiliar, and dark situations. And when we do, we can expect him to use us. And that was her experience. Now again, how many of us are going to have an experience like that? How many of us are going to face a situation like that? But whether we do face that kind of extreme, if sort of weirdly normal, sitting on a train and seeing this happening situation, or whether it's just in some other area of our lives, we, we walk through the sort of dark valley ourselves where it feels like God is absent. The book of Exodus is there so that in that moment, or in the more or mundane every day, tomorrow morning when you wake up sleepy-eyed and get on the train or whatever to commute, that like that woman, you would know that God is with you. And he will give you, he wants to support you in that moment to be faithful to him. And to to know his presence and his care and his love for you. If it feels like God isn't like that for us at the moment, that's why Exodus is written. And that's exactly why Jesus came. So that as we belong to him, and if you like, gaze ever more deeply into what he has done for us, the conviction would, would lodge safe and secure in our hearts. That even our bad things will turn out for good and our good things can never be lost and the best things are yet to come. Well, let's be quiet for a few moments and I'm going to lead us in our prayers of intercession, praying for things around the world and in our country, but let's be quiet and reflect on these verses of scripture for ourselves.